sitting from? I'm from Berkeley. From where? Berkeley. Berkeley, okay. So Okay. Absolutely. I unfortunately could not find Cracker Jack in the stores yesterday. So, one of my former Math 105 students, this is her favorite class in her entire stay at Williams, and she was kind enough to bring in two Wallies to come to the lecture. This is the newest Wally in my family. I told my daughter Kayla that she could have Wally every day but today when Wally has to come for this lecture. This caused a huge fight with my daughter. So she finally agreed to honor her deal with me that I could bring Wally to class today, but I have to give you some ground rules. No one other than myself is allowed to touch this Wally. No one other than myself is allowed to put this Wally in their mouth. She's four. Uh, Jen did not give any restrictions on her Wallies, but try to treat them with respect as well. Okay. Okay, a couple of announcements before we start from the 105 students. I'm adjusting the office hours this week because of the wonderful chance to show me how much you know on Wednesday on the next midterm. So I will be in mission for lunch today from 12 to about 1-ish. I will try to be in my office most of the afternoon. Uh, I think there's uh, one or two meetings I need to go to, but I should be around most of the time. For the prospective students, there is a science open house in the science atrium from 4.30 to 5.30 today. It's a good place to talk to people from several different departments. As the exam is Wednesday, I somehow feel a Thursday review dinner will not be as useful as a Tuesday review dinner. So I will switch the order of this week and we will have the review dinner on Tuesday, not on Thursday. So there will be no Thursday review dinner this week. Okay, remember to bring in your first exam problem at the start of class on Wednesday. All right. It's going to be hard for me to actually see the stuff over here with Wally, so I will move one of the Wally's over. Okay. So I want to welcome all of our visitors to Math 105. If you do want to see what a Math 105 exam is like, you are welcome to come back on Wednesday. If not, however, we have adjusted the curriculum a little bit, so in honor of Patriots Day, today is going to be a lecture on sabermetrics, the art of applying mathematics and statistics to baseball. If for some reason you do not like baseball, you can almost go through this lecture and replace the word baseball with economics in all places, and it will be essentially the same thing. At any point in the talk, feel free to grab food or any of these Wallies, but not that Wally. Okay, the slides are also available online. You can email me if you have any questions about the talk or mathematics or Williams in general. All right. So a couple of acknowledgments. Uh, this talk is dedicated to my great uncle, Newt Bromberg, who my son is named after, who assured me I would live long enough to see the Red Sox win a World Series. After some of the other things I've seen the Sox do, I should have asked him what else I will be seeing in my lifetime. And so Cameron and Kayla have helped with this talk. Sometimes Cameron actually gives this talk with me. He can only last about 15 minutes before he gets bored, which is not too bad for baseball. Uh, if you look very closely on this picture, you can try to see how many cups of beer you can see. It is early in the game, it's early in the season, so it's probably not as much as you would normally see. All right, so I want to talk about the Pythagorean one loss formula today. And this is a interesting statistic in baseball. And analogs of this are very important in other fields. So we'll see some applications of calculus. We'll also see where can you go after calculus? What would be a good next class? Good next class is a probability as well as statistics. And of course, the class which I always say, linear algebra, linear algebra. there we go. Okay. So the goals of the talk, I want to give you a derivation of the Pythagorean one loss formula. And I do realize I have not told you yet what it is. I want to observe some of the key ideas and techniques in mathematical modeling. And this is really one of the skills you want to get. 
most of the time you are not going to have a problem in life which is coming at you straight from a book so you know exactly what tools to use and how to solve it. You want to figure out how do you model something you care about, how do you extract the key features. We'll see how advanced theory enters in very simple problems. How many of you have seen the drowning swimmer problem? We have a swimmer in the ocean, they're drowning, you have a lifeguard on the beach, the lifeguard calculates the optimal path to save them. Anybody seen the drowning swimmer? Okay. Fortunately, it's okay that most lifeguards have not seen this calculus problem. If the lifeguard had to sit down and do a calculus problem before running into the water, we would have a lot more fatalities at sea. We have a pretty good intuitive sense of what the right answer is for many problems. But you can often do better if you know calculus or if you know more advanced mathematics. The other thing is in very simple problems, surprisingly advanced math or statistics enters. And in the drowning lifeguard problem, it's very simple to state but some interesting polynomials arise that you have to deal with. There's a lot of opportunities for inefficiency, so this is the easiest line to translate into economics. So in baseball, there are a lot of statistics that do not really convey the information people think they're conveying, and people value things incorrectly. We'll discuss some of these later today. This is a wonderful opportunity to exploit inefficiencies in the market. And the last is if you're interested in trying your hand at research, a lot of what I've done here there's some very natural generalizations that haven't been done yet that would make an excellent project. And so if you're interested, please let me know. Okay, so the goal is to go from this. This is my daughter two years ago. I will be her t-ball coach this year. She is now a princess baseball player, but you know, she's playing. To eventually something like this, a major league slugger, you know, worth millions of dollars to your team. Well, actually, let's say you own a team like the Red Sox. Or maybe the Red Sox is not a good Let's say you own a major league baseball team. What is your objective as the owner? There are two right answers. To have your team win games, to win the World Series. What else? To make money. They're not always in line. So sometimes you may be willing to not make as much money or even lose money to win the title. We'll assume for the sake of argument today that our goal is to win a World Series ring. This is a 2007 Red Sox ring. I sadly do not own it. My Father's first cousin's neighbors, this sounds like space balls, has two rings. I will not tell you what I offered in exchange for the ring because this is being recorded, but I will say I still have my wedding ring, my Yale ring, and my son. <laughs> okay, so quick review of baseball. How many of you have never seen a baseball game? Okay, all you need to know, Red Sox good, Yankees bad. Hi. <laughs> right. Somebody who's seen a little bit more baseball, how would you supplement this? What's the point in baseball? What you, what's your goal? Score, score runs. Be a little bit more specific. No, 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 no. Score, score more runs. Score more runs than the other team. Score more runs than the other team and you will win. Now, because of the great commissioner Bud Selig, a horrible catastrophe shall never again plague baseball. What has Bud Selig deemed cannot ever happen again? A tie. It would be absolutely horrible. It would be catastrophic. Other sports somehow can deal with ties. Baseball cannot. Baseball will not end in a tie. We'll just keep going and going and going. Okay? There's lots of different statistics in baseball. One of my least favorite is the save statistic. Can somebody define a save? Yes. Yep. So that's partial credit. That is a save, but there's something else you can do to get a save. It could be one or more out, but it could also be three outs, like three innings. As long as you pitch at least three innings, if you're the final pitcher, it doesn't matter how much of a lead, you get a save. So the Baltimore Orioles are great examples for extreme cases. A couple of years ago, they were playing the Texas Rangers. After six, the Texas Rangers had six, and I had 14 runs. The Orioles had three. The Orioles brought in, I mean, sorry, the Rangers brought in a relief pitcher. The Rangers are up by 11 runs. They could alternate home run out, home run out for the rest of the game and still win. Their relief pitcher held the Orioles to zero runs while his teammates brought him an additional 16. The final score was Texas 30, Baltimore 3, the pitcher gets a save. I don't know about you, but to me when I hear the word save, there's certain connotations. Coming in with an 11 run lead and being spotted an additional 16 runs does not really feel like a save situation to me. This is a situation, now it's, it's rare, but where the save statistic is not measuring what you want. It turns out the save statistic measures a lot of things and puts on a lot of emphasis on things you don't want. 
If you've read Moneyball or seen the movie, Billy Bean of the Oakland A's was excellent at taking advantage of people's misunderstanding of which statistics matter and which statistics don't. One of the things he did is he took some mediocre pitchers and drove up their save statistics. And teams would approach him wanting their star reliever. You want my star reliever? Oh, it's so hard to part with him. Ah, but I do need a second baseman, so okay, I'm willing to make the trade. Now, there's only, of course, so many times you can do this. And people start to realize, gee, <coughs> he's always making out better than we are. And so eventually people start to realize which statistics matter. When I was growing up, I had a book called Red Sox Triumphs and Tragedies. It's a little painful to bring it down because I'm a little bit old. The triumph section is like this, and the tragedy section is kind of like this. It was written the year after the Bucky Dent fiasco. When it was giving the statistics for the Sox in the late 70s, it didn't have on-base percentage. It didn't have slugging percentage. It had, instead, how often someone is hit by a pitch. And so depending on which statistics you're given, it frames your mind as to which plays are valuable and not. And so the quest is to find which statistics really convey the information you want. All right. So here, who knows what RISP, the two is actually two outs. One is in scoring positions. So nowadays you have these fancy scoreboards, fancy boards with all of this information being you know, shown at you. And we can get all of this in real time. When I was a postdoc at Ohio State, I participated in a data analysis seminar. And one of the quotes has stuck with me ever since. Can't remember who said it, but I do remember the quote. We have weather satellites in orbit, much more useful than on the ground, beaming information to us at such a rate that every day they send more information than is in the Library of Congress. And we have a couple of hours to use that information to make our weather predictions. So when you have this much information, there's two things to learn. One, you're a fool not to use it. And two, you need a great way to cull all the data that's there and get something useful. So if you continue in statistics and get up to like a data mining class, wonderful skill to get is how do you make sense of all the stuff that's coming at you. All right, so here's the parameters. RS observed stands for run scored observed. You know, this is the average number of runs my team scores per game. Runs, uh, A observed is runs allowed observed, how many runs I allow per game. And gamma is some parameter constant for sports. I've done this for baseball. I've done this also for hockey. You could also do this for basketball or football. Any thoughts why the formulas predicting winning percentages will be much better in baseball than in football. The numbers are bigger in football. Which number? Uh, the, so okay. the scores are bigger in football. The scores are bigger in football. That's actually not where the issue is. Fewer games. You can go to sleep for a month in baseball and not really miss much. In football, there's 16 games versus 162 in baseball. One game is essentially worth 10 games in baseball. This is why you know, the football games are watched, even if your team is not playing, often the game that's playing has implications for your team's playoff hopes. OK. So here is Bill James' Pythagorean one-loss formula. This is a numerical observation he made decades ago, just culling through data from you know, different seasons, how many wins a team has, how many losses, how many runs are they scoring, how many runs are they allowing. He found a really good prediction for team's winning percentage, you know, number of wins divided by number of games, is run scored to the gamma over run scored to the gamma plus runs allowed to the gamma. And he found that if you take gamma equals 2, you get a pretty good fit. We now take gamma to be about 1.82. We found that's a better fit. But you know, back then, it's much simpler to just use 2 when you're doing this on you know, pen and paper. Any thoughts as to why this is called the Pythagorean one-loss formula? So run scored squared over run scored squared plus runs allowed squared. Why is he calling this Pythagoras? Yeah, I mean, it looks like, you know, in a right triangle, A squared plus B squared is C squared. There's no triangles in baseball unless you cut, you know, the ballpark down the middle or maybe a certain section of Fenway Park. There's no triangle going on. But he just noticed, hey, you know, it kind of looks like sums of squares. Where have I seen sums of squares, Pythagoras? Why not name it after Pythagoras? All right. Absolutely nothing to do with right triangles. But the name has stuck. So just for some numerics, in 2009, the Sox were 95 and 67, scored 872 runs, allowed 736 for a prediction of 93.4 wins. Not bad. The Yankees, and since I'm going to have so many pro Red Sox things, I figured, you know, for fairness, I'll have at least one or two pro Yankees. 
The Yankees were 103 and 59, but they were predicted to be 95 wins. So not surprisingly, the formula is not going to be perfect. It's not going to tell you exactly how many runs without error. Normally, the formula is right to about four wins per season. Typically, we attribute deviations above four wins to the value of the manager. You know, a really good manager is able to squeeze a little bit more out of their team. And metrics like this are used by many people to say that Joe Torrey was an outstanding manager for the New York Yankees when he was there. So for those Red Sox fans who remember 2011 and the historic collapse, the Red Sox should have been 95 and 67, and Tampa should have been 92 and 70. So technically, we actually made the playoffs in 2011. If you want to know how well we did, ask me after class. All right, so why do we care about the Pythagorean one-loss formula? So here are three of the main reasons. The first is extrapolation. So a couple of years ago was a great year as a Red Sox fan. The Yankees started off 21 and 29. As a Sox fan, however, I'm not happy until the season is over and the Yankees have mathematically been eliminated from the playoffs. So you're the New York Yankees. You have basically an almost unlimited payroll and a manager, I'm sorry, and an owner willing to spend it, but you don't want to just completely throw the money away. So if you're 21 and 29, are you a bad team? If yes, do you want to conserve your resources for future years? Do you want to save your prospects and your farm system? Do you not want to sign an expensive player who might only be good for one or two seasons because it may not be the best use of your money? Or are you really better than your 21 and 29 record indicates? All the metrics said the Yankees were far better than 21 and 29. They had had a string of bad luck, and they should be expected to do significantly better in the remainder of the season. The Yankees chose to hire Roger Clemens for a very large salary. He replaced their number five pitcher, and the Yankees did make the playoffs. So this is one of the reasons we care about this. The next is evaluation, to see if one team is consistently overperforming or underperforming. This becomes a good way to you know, understand maybe manager's contributions. Another thing is to try to see where the deals are. Who's your real threat? You know, if a team is consistently underperforming like the Yankees were at the start of the season, don't write them off. One of my favorite moves the Yankees did, it didn't quite work, is the Red Sox had a knuckleball pitcher called Tim Wakefield, and it's very hard to catch a knuckleball pitcher. We had a catcher named Doug Mirabelli who did a great job catching him, but wasn't happy that he played essentially just one out of every five games. He went to San Diego. The Sox realized that without Mirabelli, Wakefield was much less effective. We decided to get Mirabelli back, and the Yankees decided to try to get Mirabelli as well. They didn't want Mirabelli to play, they just didn't want the Red Sox to have him. So there's a lot of really good strategies to try to figure out who do you want on your team? Who do you not want on someone else's team? How much are things worth? What is the value of somebody? The last is, you know, the advantage is we have formulas that tell you how many runs a given player is expected to produce for your team given their batting profile. How many singles, doubles, triples, home runs, how fast they are. And this will allow you to evaluate how much money you'd be willing to spend for this player. If you're very close to making the playoffs, a few more wins could push you into the playoffs and it will be worth a lot. If you stink, Going from 65 wins to 69 wins, not a big deal. Play is probably not worth that much to your team. Another thing that's worth noting is the Pythagorean one-loss formula is actually a very simple formula to state and use. It doesn't need to be. This is one of the advantages of the 21st century over the 20th and the 19th. In the 1800s, when you were calculating statistics by hand, you really couldn't do that many complicated calculations. Batting average is a very easy statistic to understand. Look at how many hits divided by how many at-bats. We can all understand this. It's this, the probability of successfully hitting the ball and not getting out. With the 21st century and incredibly abundant and powerful computers, you can afford to have more complicated statistics. It turns out to be very nice that we have a simple statistic like this, but it's not absolutely essential. How many of you are interested in economics or finance? Not that many, but for those of you who are, what you will sadly learn is it's very hard to solve in closed form most economics problems. What you have to do is if you want to see well, what will happen if I change the tax rate, you have to do simulations. As you keep changing the parameters, you have to simulate again and again and again. Simulations are expensive. It's incredibly nice that we have this closed form expression. You tell me how my run scored increases and I can tell you how many wins that should translate into. So it's a very nice feature of the formula. Uh, in 2004, here's a little snapshot in a couple of, you know, starts of a couple of months as to how many wins the Sox would be predicted to have based on their performance. 
you can see this long period of time when they're steady between 93 and 92, and all of a sudden, they shoot up in 98 wins. You know, something happened to the Sox at the end of 2004 when they were making their playoff run. All right. So what I want to do now is introduce just very briefly a few of the key ideas and concepts we need from probability. For those of you who have not taken a math class with me before, if you have never heard a sentence with integration and area and probability together, I apologize. What I want to do is I want to show you why we care so much about finding integrals. So the goal is we observe some kind of scoring distribution, and I want to find a way to mathematically model it. Of course, I might not be concerned with the scoring distribution. Maybe this is the you know, grades on the upcoming midterm for my class. Well, hopefully not. Maybe this is better yet, maybe the number of missed points on my upcoming exam, which would be much nicer, which means I could grade the exams a lot faster. Maybe this is distribution of heights of Lego people. Now, do you think this could be distribution of heights of Lego people? No. The, not quite. They have slightly different hairdos now. But um, for the most part, Lego people are essentially the same size. I would not expect to see this much fluctuation. Okay? But maybe I have some kind of data like this. And I want to model this with some kind of functions so that I can use mathematical and statistical techniques. So let's let x be a random variable with density p of x. What does this mean? Well, here's a plot of my density p of x. And I want p of x to have three properties. I want it to be non-negative. I want it to integrate to 1. And the last is the probability that my value of x is between a and b is the area under the curve from a to b. This is why we care so much about finding areas in calculus. Areas equal probabilities of events. I want to know how likely something is to happen. I find the area under the curve from A to B. These are very natural constraints to have. No matter how bad a team is, the probability they win a game is not going to be below zero, and it's not going to be above 100. It's not going to be above 100%. So the next thing is, if you've ever taken an exam, you should know what the mean is, the average score in the class. Every grade conscious student knows this. The next is the variance. How spread out is the distribution? So what I'm doing is I'm looking at x minus mu squared times p of x, and I'm integrating this. The larger this quantity is, the more spread out the scores are, the more fluctuations I have in my students. The tighter it is, the closer it is. There are other quantities you can look at as well. You can look at basically integrating this to the third power or the fourth power. It's very rare that you need this. When I was visiting a friend at Harvard many years ago, I saw the grades in a physics course posted outside. The professor gave the mean, the variance, and the third and the fourth moment, so that the grade conscious Harvard students would know exactly how they fared relative to everyone else in the class. Most of the time, mean and variance is all you really need. What's the average value? What's the scale of my fluctuations? The last concept I need from probability is that of independence. So we say two events are independent if knowledge of one random variable gives me no information of knowledge of the other. Co so can somebody, and your know, visitors are welcome to play as well, give me two events that you think are independent, where knowledge of one gives me no information of knowledge of the other. So I mean, two things that are independent. Well, everything in the world is dependent. Yes? Um, knowing the weather gave me, I know how old you are. Good. The weather today probably does not tell you how old I am. Right? A uh, standard example is flipping a coin and rolling a die. How many of you have seen Price is Right? Uh, in Price is Right, they have the showcase showdown where they have the wheel, the numbers are marked from 0 to 100 in steps of 5. The goal is to get as close to 100 as possible without going over. And you have two spins. Do you think the two spins are independent? So you spin the wheel on, then you spin again. So I can think of two reasons why the spins are not independent. Because the same vigor with which you would pull down the first time would be right. the same that you're going to pull the second time. So depending how many steps you went around, it would be the same amount of steps. Oh, I, don't, I actually don't think you'd use the same vigor. What's your goal? Your goal is to get as close to 100 as possible. So based on your first score, if you got a 65, I hope I can do the math in my head, you want to aim for 35. So that might adjust how strongly you pull down your vigor. There's another reason why they might be dependent. It would be really boring television to reset the wheel to where it started. 
So you're now spinning from where it stopped. If you play roulette, they're not going to take the ball out and put the ball back in the same starting point. They want to keep it moving. So there's a lot of times you have to worry, maybe there's some hidden dependencies. And sometimes it takes a lot of work to take all of these into account. All right. So here are two guidelines for mathematical modeling. So the first is the model should capture the key features of the system, and the second is the model should be mathematically tractable. Sadly, these two pull us in opposite directions. So how many of you are familiar with Galileo's experiment where he drops two balls off the Tower of Pisa? OK. Does the color of the ball matter? Probably not. Maybe different colors will heat up differently, and there'll be different temperatures as they're falling through. OK. Color probably doesn't matter. What do you think might matter when he's dropping the two balls? The surface area. And you maybe if I have something that's at a point versus something that's at a sphere or a flat plane, I could get very different behavior. Maybe the density matters. Maybe, you know, it's maybe while the mass might not matter, maybe it matters how is the weight distributed throughout the ball. So what you want to do is you want to figure out which are the key features in the problem that have to be included in your model and which ones don't really matter. When we're trying to understand falling bodies, I think it's safe to assume the color doesn't matter and not work in a color variable to our experiment. All right, so here is a possible model. We're a few minutes ahead of the 10 o'clock section, so I can spend a little bit more time on having you shoot down my model. So I am proposing the following model for baseball, and I'm going to give you a hint. It's wrong. Tell me why it's wrong. So I'm assuming runs scored and runs allowed are independent random variables, and I assume that their values are drawn from independent, you know, prob uh, from independent probability density functions. One for runs scored, one for runs allowed. Why might this be a bad model for baseball? So here, you do need a little bit of knowledge of baseball beyond Red Sox good, Yankees bad. So what's, what's something potentially wrong with this model? Well, so the number of runs scored is how many runs I score in a game, and the number of runs allowed is how many runs I give up in that game. So, you know, is it 7 4? Is it 3 8? You know, what's the final score in the game? So, do you think runs scored and runs allowed are independent? Why not? Because the best pitchers only match up against the best pitchers because they both start the season at the same time. Okay, so one possibility is you could have pitching alignments. What else? Yes. Yes. So anybody remember Remlinger for the Red Sox? A couple of years ago, we had a pitcher named Remlinger. At one point in the season for the Red Sox, he had not yet recorded an out. He'd allowed runs, he just hadn't gotten anybody out yet. And so when he was brought in to pitch one day, they didn't have a symbol for an ERA of plus infinity, so they just had three dashes by his ERA. The Sox were up 10 to 3. There was no way this guy was coming in in a close game. But, you know, 10 to 3, you know, somebody has to pitch the ninth inning. Let's let him pitch. Very quickly, he gave up a grand slam. You know, he did get three outs before allowing seven runs, but it was a lot closer than it needed to be. There is no way he would have been brought in. So when you watch you know, political returns on election nights, they often call states before everything is in. You could essentially call that game for the Red Sox. Almost surely, with a seven-run lead in the ninth inning, you're going to win the game. You can put in some garbage pitches to just get you to that inning. So those final runs that are being scored are not really the same as the runs from earlier in the game. So I would say there's definitely dependencies between runs scored and runs allowed. You might also take out some of your better players if you have a huge lead and let them rest. Uh, can anybody think of any other reasons? We have another like two minutes to attack my model. So I'll give one uh, example from uh, just a few days ago. So on Saturday, I took the family to Fenway Park to watch the Red Sox play the Rays. So it was an exciting pitches duel. So, you know, 1-1 after eight innings. Uh, game goes into extra innings. Tampa has a runner on base, and they pull their catcher and put in a pinch runner. Now, why would they put in a pinch runner? And wait, what? Yeah, you're thinking he had a bad start. So he was going to go in the second Right, so the hope is that with a pinch runner, he can advance more bases on a hit. And so, you know, you just, at this point, you know, if you can score and hold the Red Sox to nothing, you win the game. Now, fortunately for the Red Sox, Tampa was not able to score. But
But once you pull a player, you can't put them back in the game. So Tampa had to put in their backup catcher. Jacoby Ellsbury for the Sox is now on first base in the bottom of the 10th with one out. So it's quite clear he's going to try to steal second. And so their catcher is not as good. He overthrows second. Ellsbury gets all the way to third base. Now we have a runner on third, one out. Long fly ball or a hit now wins the game for the Red Sox. And in fact, Victorino gets an infield single and you know, the Sox win. So this is definitely related to the game state. It is They made a defensive sacrifice for a potential offensive gain. So it's absurd to say runs scored and runs allowed are independent. But there's also something else. And I mentioned this earlier. I mentioned one person who will give us a dependency between runs scored and runs allowed. Our glorious leader in baseball, Bud Selig. Right? What kind of dependency do you know between runs scored and runs allowed? What kind of information? So I'm thinking of a game from a couple of years ago. Red Sox are playing Baltimore, and Baltimore ends the game with five runs. What do you know about the Red Sox? They couldn't have had five runs because baseball games won't end in a tie. This is the Mother's Day miracle, one of my favorite games. The Sox are down 5-0 in the, in the bottom of the ninth, and they score six runs with the last one coming, coming on an error. But you know it can't end in a tie, so there has to be some relation between runs scored and runs allowed. This leads to some very interesting statistical analysis as to how do you handle these dependencies. Uh, one place where this is done is in hospitals. And if you're interested, there's some information on this on the appendices. If you go into a hospital, it's reasonable to assume that you come out no worse off than when you go in. Yes, occasionally they remove the wrong organ, it's sad. But you know, for the most part, when you go to a hospital, right, you shouldn't leave worse than you come. So when you're trying to do the analysis and see how effective the treatment is, it's often reasonable to say, well, these options are not going to be accessible. I, I want to try to figure out what's the probability I score more runs than I allow from this simple model. And I agree this is a simple model. I agree there's a lot more we can do. But it turns out this simple model will do a good job predicting Major League Baseball results. So I want to calculate the probability I score more runs than I allow. Well, there's two possibilities. Either the number of runs scored is discrete or the number of runs scored is continuous. So let's look at the discrete case first. So if I win the game, let's say I score I runs and I allow J runs. Well, if I win, I has to be greater than J. So I sum over all pairs of I and J where I is greater than J. This is the probability I score I runs. This is the probability I allow J runs. This will be the probability I win. Or I could do the continuous case. I could look at the integral over X goes from 0 to infinity. I score X runs. Y goes from 0 to X. I allow at most Y runs. And this will be the probability I score more runs than I allow. Now, if you notice, here I do not allow j to equal i. Here I allow y to equal x. Well, if you think about it, y equals x is this line over here. And this region, y less than equal to x, is this infinite triangle over here. The probability when I have a two-dimensional integral of y exactly being x, this is basically calculating the area of a line. The area of a line is 0. So I don't really have to worry about y equaling x. I can just write it like this. So you need a little bit of baseball knowledge. Which do you think is going to be better for baseball, a discrete model or a continuous model? Why discrete? Because you can't score 4.4 runs. That's right. As much as I would love to see ESPN struggle with recording the Red Sox beat the Yankees pi to e, this is not going to happen. OK? However, I'm already willing to do this. I'm also willing to do this. I'm willing to take a continuous model and not a discrete. Any thoughts as to why I would model things continuously and not discreetly? Let's see. Hint. What class are you sitting in on? Calc 3. If I do things continuously, I have all the tools and techniques of calculus at my disposal. There is no theory, the advanced theory of summation. Right? We don't have great formulas for sums. We do have great formulas for integrals. We have the fundamental theorem of calculus. We have antiderivatives. So yes, this will unfortunately allow me to consider the case of the Red Sox beating the Yankees pi to e, but it's worth it to have the tools of calculus available. All right. So we're reduced to calculating one of these two. We're going to calculate the continuous case. And so here's a couple of problems with the model, and we've discussed a lot of these. The first is, what are the densities for runs scored and runs allowed? 
you know, if I'm assuming they're modeled from some density, I need some idea of what those densities are. The second is, are the runs scored and runs allowed independent? Well, we've already talked about why they're not. And the hope is, though, that these dependencies are small enough that for all practical purposes, a lot of these effects are canceling, and we can get a pretty good answer by assuming independence. And the last is a practical one. It does me no good to write down this integral if I can't evaluate it. So can I evaluate this integral in closed form? So I'm going to give you a couple of probability densities, and I want you to tell me if you think this is good or bad. So here is a very easy one to do integrals. I'm going to take the uniform distribution. So the probability I score zero runs is just the integral from zero to one. The probability I score two runs is just the integral from two to three. So this requires a little baseball knowledge. Why is this a bad model for run distribution in baseball? Scoring three or four or five runs is a lot more common than scoring any other. Yeah, so not all runs are equally likely. It's very rare to have a you know, one to zero game. It's very rare to score 10 or more runs. So this assigning all values equally is not a good choice. All right, for those of you who are visiting us, if you haven't met the bell curve, you will almost surely meet this at some point in your college stay. A lot of professors use this to grade on a curve. Is this a good model for runs scored and runs allowed? I can think of two issues with this. You can't score negative runs, and it's assigning some sort of probability to negative Yes. No matter how bad your team are, and we do have a couple of bad teams, you will not score negative runs in a game. There's also another problem with this. You can't score like half a run. Well, we've already accepted that as a problem, yes. I, I, I agree that that's a problem. This does allow half a run. It doesn't allow for scores over 11 either. No, th this distribution actually goes off to infinity. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. It goes off to infinity, though, very rapidly. This does assign a finite probability to scoring a billion runs in a game. OK? Now, do you expect to ever see a baseball game with the score of a billion runs? No. Now, fortunately, the probability of signs to score to runs of over 30 is so negligibly small, we don't have to worry about it. In the previous section, somebody asked me, well, well what about scoring 20,000 runs in a game? I think in baseball, you would have almost like a mercy rule where a team would take pity on the other team and just at some point stop. Anybody know the most lopsided professional or college sports score ever? Georgia Tech versus Cumberland, 222 to 0 in football. Cumberland beat Georgia Tech in football, and if they didn't play them, I'm sorry, in baseball, and if they didn't play them in football, they would owe Georgia Tech a certain amount of money. Cumberland scrounged up a team somehow. The head coach of Georgia Tech split his team into two and said, whoever scores the most gets a steak dinner. There was no mercy. This was out for blood. He was so happy with the result, everybody from Georgia Tech got steak. So most of the time, however, even in a situation like that, there is a limit to how many runs you will put up. Okay? So yes, this does allow me to score 20,000 runs, but the probability is so negligibly small, I don't need to worry about it. What about the exponential distribution? This doesn't assign probabilities to scoring negative numbers of runs, and it still decays really fast. Why is this not a good model for baseball? So here you need to know a little bit about how baseball scores are. So if you look at this, the most common score would be zero runs in the game, followed by one run, followed by two runs. And just baseball scoring is not like that. It's not quite as bad as soccer. You know, we have maybe four or so runs per game. I want to introduce you to a new distribution, the Weibull distribution. It's a beautiful family of distributions. It has three free parameters. And the reason I thought to try this for baseball is I know a special case of the Weibull which arose in some physics that I had studied. And I know I can do integrals involving Weibulls, so I thought this would be a good thing to try. Because it has three parameters, it can take on many different shapes. So I want to talk a little bit about the parameters. The first is the parameter alpha. And this basically just scales things. So you have x minus beta over alpha. Think of alpha as changing from meters to feet. It's going to adjust how wide things are. The next is beta. And since I always have x minus beta, all beta does is it translates the entire graph. It just shifts everything over. The one that really matters is gamma. Gamma controls the shape of the distribution. Different values of gamma will give you strongly different shapes. So here are a couple of plots of Weibulls. So when I take 1, 0, 1 for my parameters, I actually get the exponential distribution. In general, the Weibull gives you what's called technically a one-bump distribution. It goes up, goes down. 
As you vary alpha, you can control how wide the bump is. As you vary gamma, you can control how sharp the spike is and the shape and whatnot. It turns out this does a really good job of fitting lots of different data, especially baseball data. Other places where it arrives, arises is in survival analysis. So when gamma is less than one, this is a situation with like high infant mortality. Gamma greater than one, people survive for a long time. So if you take statistics, you will see things like the Weibull modeling lots of different things. So my students have seen the gamma function several times. So the gamma function generalizes the factorial function. So gamma of s is the integral of e to the minus u, u to the s minus 1 du. So if I let s equal n, where n is a positive integer, it turns out gamma of n is n minus 1 factorial. If you haven't seen this before, this is a nice thing to try to prove by mathematical induction integration by parts. It's a fun exercise for certain people's definitions of fun. Why is this useful? Well, it turns out that the Weibull distribution, you can calculate the mean and the variance explicitly in terms of the parameters. So I said, you know, one of the issues in a lot of things in economics is you don't have closed form expressions and you have to do simulations. Here, I can write the mean and the variance explicitly in terms of the parameters of my Weibull distribution and the special function, the gamma function. So for my 105 students, when we talked about fractional factorials, this is actually a place where they arise. You know, they'll come in here in terms of calculating the mean and the variance. All right. So if you want to actually see how to do the mean calculation, I've put all the details here. You know, read this at your leisure. There's some you know, fun integration uh, tricks that you can do here. We'll see some of these tricks again in a few minutes when we prove the Pythagorean formula. So I'm not going to really dwell on this calculation now, but you know, it's on the slides if you want to see the details. All right. Here is a snapshot from a couple of years ago from, I think, MLB.com. One of the things you notice, especially uh, those of you who have entered the 21st century, I did so a couple months ago, you have a, a smartphone, you have a very limited screen. And so you have to be very careful as to which statistics do you want to display. Okay, team name, that's a pretty important statistic. All right? Wins, losses, yes. How many games back, yes. These are really important things. One of the things that they display in the expanded statistics is XWL, that stands for expected one loss or the Pythagorean predictions. So this statistic is considered important enough that on a very expensive uh, region where you know, real estate costs a lot, this is one of the things they choose to display. Okay, uh, the next few slides is going back to a problem I gave on the first day of class on how to try to predict a team's winning percentage. This is a simpler variant of the Pythagorean one loss formula, and so the details are here. All right, so here is the Pythagorean one loss formula, or for me, I'll call it a theorem because I'm a mathematician. Let's assume I have two teams, or let's assume I have a team and I have the runs scored and runs allowed are drawn from Weibulls, and they're independent of each other. I'll assume I have the same gamma for each, I'll assume I have the same beta for each, and I'll choose the alphas so that the mean of the Weibull for runs scored matches the observed mean, and the mean for the runs allowed matches the observed runs allowed. Then the probability that I win is runs scored minus beta to the gamma over runs scored minus beta to the gamma plus runs allowed minus beta to the gamma. This is essentially the Pythagorean formula. In all of the stuff we do, beta is going to be minus a half. And the reason is it's just how we want to do our bins. So again, we've talked about how we should not allow ourselves to score half a run or pi runs in a game. When I want to talk about scoring zero runs, I could say zero to everything less than one counts as scoring zero runs. The problem with that is then the values I care about, 0, 1, 2, 3, they're right at the edges of my bins. It's much better to have them at the center. Zero runs will be scoring between minus a half and a half runs. One run will be scoring from one half to one and a half runs. So beta is going to be minus a half just to translate things. And so it turns out that if you have a y with these parameters, then the mean, as I said before, is a very nice simple expression. So we can figure out after a little bit of algebra, if you give me the mean, what should my alphas be? So my alpha run scored is run scored minus beta over a nice value of the gamma function. So all we have to do now is calculate the probability that x is greater than y. So we have about seven or eight minutes left. We can finally hit calc 3. Okay? Fortunately, it's going to be a nice calc 3 integral. It's essentially going to be integrating over this triangle. So I want to calculate the probability x is greater than y. So it's this double integral. And these are my densities. So I now substitute for the values, and I have this beautiful expression to deal with. All right. Well, the first thing to do is to change variables. Rather than integrating from beta, 
to infinity or beta to x. Let's just shift everything by beta. And so now my integrals are going to go from 0 to infinity and 0 to x. And so I now have this integral. This integral is actually a lot nicer than it looks. I have e to the minus crap to the gamma, and I have crap to the gamma minus 1. Right? This is u substitution at its best. If I let u be basically this to the gamma, du is essentially going to be this over here up to a constant. So by doing a very nice u substitution, I can convert this to essentially just integrating an exponential function. And the integral is not going to be bad. And so I'll get 1 minus the exponential of this. I now have two integrals to do. The first integral is not so bad. This is a probability density. This is just my function f, and I'm integrating it against 1. Well, any probability integrates to 1. So the first part is going to be 1, and now I'm left with this integral here. And so I have two different exponentials. They both have an x to the gamma, but they have different alphas in the denominator. And so when I combine them, if I want to write it as x over alpha to the gamma, the 1 over alpha to the gamma is this wonderful combination. How many of you have taken physics and done like, and done like resistors? I, I always forget if it's resistors in series or resistors in parallel, but this is essentially how the resistors add. If you've done uh, any physics with you know, planetary motion, how you combine masses for the two-body problem comes in like this. This is a very common phenomenon in a lot of algebra. The next pages just go through now. We have this integral, and let's just do the algebra and just keep doing the algebra. And when the dust settles, we get the Pythagorean formula. So it just follows from doing a nice two-dimensional integral. The question, of course, is can we find you know, good choices for these parameters so that these variables do a good job of modeling our data? So I had to choose a season. I chose one almost at random. I chose 2004. So let's analyze what happened in 2004, shall we? All right. Here is a plot of the runs scored for the Sox and the runs allowed for the Red Sox. Which is a good fit? Which is a bad fit? Are they both good? Are they both bad? Is it split? Is one better? What do you think? So this one, I think we can clearly admit this one is better than that. But the question is, is it a good fit? You know, I have 162 data points. Is a fit like this a pretty good fit or not? And this is where you really want to take a stats course. You don't want to just be trusting your eyes. And so this is, there's lots of different methods you can use to evaluate how good of the fit is. I like the method of least squares. There's other ones as well. What I can do is I can see how many times do I observe a game with exactly k runs? How many times do I predict I'll have a game with exactly k runs? And I square the difference and I add. So the reason we square is we don't want positive errors and negative errors to balance. If I overestimate 1 by 10 games and underestimate 1 by 10 games, I don't want those to cancel. So the smaller the sum of the squares is, the better job I've done. So this is just one of many statistics you'd learn in an advanced stats class to try to get a sense of how good the fit is. The smaller this number, the smaller the chi-squared statistic, the better the fit. All right, so now here's the Red Sox again. Here are the Yankees. What do you think? Good or not good? I'm not talking about the team. I'm just talking about the fit. It's clear about the team. Good fit or bad fit? Yeah, I think it's okay. Baltimore Orioles? The runs allowed seems to always be a little bit better. This, this over here kind of bothers me a little bit. The Tampa Bay Devil Rays. This was back when they were the Devil Rays. What do you think? Yeah, and really good job fitting the tails. Right? You know, Tampa did a wonderful job. I'm sure they must have had a mathematician in the dugout telling the players exactly what to be doing so that they could have this beautiful decay just like theory would predict. Toronto Blue Jays. But they're Canadian. So you need to take that into account. You know, could be metric? No. All right. So it's actually not surprising that one of the themes I'm showing you is actually bad. If all the data is really good, you should suspect something is wrong. And I'll talk a little bit more about that right now. Imagine sometime later today you're bored and you're willing to flip a fair coin one million times. Okay? I'm a mathematician. Uh, I've taken some econ. I don't mind making unreasonable assumptions. You expect to get 500,000 heads. What do you expect for your fluctuations? How often do you expect to have maybe 1,000 more heads than tails? How often do you expect to have 50,000 more heads than tails? Well, it turns out 95% of the time, the number of heads should be within 1,000 of the expected value. But 
What if I were to do this a bunch of independent times? What if I were to flip a million coins and record whether or not I was outside this range and then do this again and again and again? Well, if I keep doing this, each time I have a 95% chance of being in the window. For both of, for two tries, it would be 95 squared. For three tries, to have all three of them in 95 cubed. By the time I flip it 14 independent you know, trials of a million, I've got over a 51% chance that at least one point will be outside my range. So it's not surprising that at least one of the teams was a bit outside. I would have been shocked if all the data was good. And so there's an advanced theory that allows you to take into account and adjust things. So I'll quickly end with what's called the chi-squared values. The normal value would be about 31.41. So about 95% of the time, you should get a value of at most 31.41. Which team is bad? The Blue Jays. When you take into account the adjustment, it should be 95% of the time, if you do this 14 times, you won't see a value greater than 41.14. Right, I've got 41.18, close enough. All right. So here's you know, some detailed analysis as to how you would do all these tests. In conclusion, these are the best fit values of gamma I get. The games I'm off by, on average, it's about four games per season. The Cleveland Indians, thank you, came in really nicely. And the gammas I'm getting is around 1.7, 1.8, you know, very close to what's been numerically observed as the best. So you know, in conclusion, the Weibos seem to do a really good job. And even though runs scored and runs allowed are not independent, they seem to be functioning as if they are independent. We're getting good results from our model. It's doing a good job of matching reality. The best fit value of gamma is pretty close to what we've numerically observed as best. And the Pythagorean one loss formula, we now have an idea of why it's true. One of the dangers is if somebody gives you a formula in stock analysis that works, how do you know the formula will keep working? This gives us some reason to hope that it will continue to work. So for future work, if anybody is interested, one is a microanalysis. So runs scored are worth different amounts in different ballparks. Some ballparks, it's very easy to score a run. A run there, you know, ballpark effects, is not the same as a run in another place. Another is to try to do this for other sports. Another is can you do closed forms other than Weibles? And you know, finally is talking about valuing runs. So you know, to all of our guests, you know, thank you for visiting us today. If you have any questions, I'm happy to chat. Uh, please feel free to shoot me an email or just swing by and say hello. For my 